Let's talk about what ifs this year. Got a lot of what ifs. Oh, the time is ticking away. We're about to answer a lot of these. But first, what about week two? We're counting down to week one, but week two is where we start with Beckett tonight. He said, what if week two is the most chaotic week of the season? Beckett, let me just go ahead and give you a ceremonial paper pop, because my friend, that very well could be the case. Stats and info, or as you might know him, producer Jesse, tells me there are 15 Power 5 versus Power 5 out-of-conference games that week. Among them, Texas at Alabama, Texas A&M at Miami, Iowa, Iowa State is that day. Notre Dame, NC State is that day. Utah is at Baylor that day. Jesse, I think this is the one where Oregon plays Texas Tech, isn't it? Maybe? Yeah. So, so Cincy, Pittsburgh, Vandy, Wake Forest is this day. Is Vandy starting off 2-0, 3-0, 4-0? Well, uh, that game will go a long way in deciding that. Oh, that's also Nebraska-Colorado Day. So there is a lot going on on this afternoon. Yes, that is Oregon-Texas Tech Day. Auburn goes to Cal. Just throwing them out there. Wisconsin, Washington State, Arizona is visiting Mississippi State this year. So there's a lot of weird-looking matchups. Uh, point being, I just mentioned a few of them that will actually impact the playoff race. I mentioned several more that could impact conference championship races. I didn't even have time to mention the fact that Ole Miss goes to Tulane that day. You've got OU at SMU that day. SMU with, I think, three straight top 20 portal classes. It could be a big shakeup weekend. And the other thing is, you know, one of the big rules Mima always had when I was growing up is don't get married to the results you see in week one. And yet everyone every season gets married to the result they see in week one. Week two is still way too early to know what or whom a team is. And yet there will be people, based on what they saw in week one, that think they know exactly what's coming in week two. And that is a recipe for you eating ramen noodles in week three because you bet things you weren't supposed to bet on, things you're not supposed to bet on, using logic you weren't supposed to be using. We have been there. We've all been there a time or two. Hopefully you come out of that wilderness. And the Ramen Noodle Express would never lead you astray like that. But week two could be wild. And so what if it happens? Well, I think the answer is obvious there. The answer is you kind of hit reset on a lot of your expectations your preview magazines, you just toss them in the bonfire. They're no good anymore. And that's not even to mention by week two, we've probably, unfortunately, got some inevitable injuries that have happened for major teams, which is also turning your expectations upside down. Yeah, week two is one to circle, kids. Keep an eye on that. Next up, uh, this one could be a little wild as well. Let's go to the West Coast. Dax said, what if a team in the bottom half of the Pac-12 odds makes the conference championship game? Well, I guess it would be irresponsible of me to not remind you who's in the top half and who's in the bottom half of the Pac-12 championship odds. And I also want to let you guys know, don't be the casual that comes in the comments and say, nobody cares about the Pac-12 this year. Pac-12 is going to have a very entertaining product this year. Remember, it doesn't always have to be a college football playoff sticker on the side of the game for you to care about it. At least I hope it doesn't. So Southern Cal, Oregon, Washington, Utah, Oregon State, UCLA. That's the top half of the Pac-12 when it comes to odds. So what the question is, is Washington State, Colorado, Arizona, Cal, Arizona State, Stanford, what if one of those teams plays for the conference title? Well, my response to that would be, of course, which team's it going to be? That's all I would care about. And I would go Washington State. Not only are they the next odds team listed, I think all eyes would be on Washington State because they avoid USC, they avoid Utah, uh, they got that new offensive coordinator, by the way, I think one of the very youngest in the Power 5 level, uh, Ben Arbuckle. He was the OC at Western Kentucky. He's out there now. Cam Ward, quarterback, is still out there. The impact on the rest of the Pac-12 also here would reverberate nationally because unless Washington State somehow has found a way to just go undefeated in conference play, and that explains their presence in the Pac-12 championship game, could they be in the Pac-12 championship game as a result of everyone else out there imploding and everyone having three losses on their resume, and as a result, none of them being in the college football playoff picture. I think that may be probably a more likely scenario than Washington State going undefeated. Uh, but the win totals out there, just to give you an idea of what this would take, this would be a team with a preseason over-under win total of six making the conference title game. That's some Big 12 stuff right there. That stuff happens in the Big 12. Next up, Hmm, interesting scenario being posed to us from South Bend, Indiana. Pablo said, what if Notre Dame's record decreases for a second straight year? I guess that'd be a trend because it's two years in a row. 
Uh, to give you a refresher course, so they were 11-2 and two in the last year under Brian Kelly. They were 9-4 and four last year. That was Marcus Freeman's first year. This year, for this to happen, they would obviously be 8-5 and five or 7-5 and five or counting the bowl game or not counting the bowl game. So what if that happens? Well, I'll tell you what if on my part. My, my what if would be, what if it happens? Well, we would have to have a reminder at how hard it is to win. And when you make a head coach his first job being a major program, these are some of the growing pains you actually should expect. It should be a surprise when this doesn't happen as opposed to when it does happen. And so their over-under win total is 8.5 right now. So, I mean, 8 is right there in the card. 7 wins, it wouldn't be crazy. Now, of course, 10 wins wouldn't be crazy either. But remember, we talked about Notre Dame's schedule the other night. There is one team, and it's them. They are the only team in the country in all of Power 5 that plays three teams with a preseason over-under win total of 10 or more. That's Ohio State at home, that's USC at home, and that's at Clemson, which is obviously on the road. So what if they lose those three games, none of which they'll be a favorite in, and then what if they randomly lose to, like, at Louisville? That's the second road game in as many weeks for them. What if they fall to, to Pitt or someone like that? That wouldn't be crazy. What if they go to NC State and lose in week three? Well, that makes them a four-loss team. And then the bowl game would decide if they improved or didn't improve. I would look at it, and let's just say they go 8-5 and five this year. I'd look at it and say, all right, Notre Dame went 8-5. and five. Fell short of expectation. It's not time to torch and pitchfork the program, though, is what I would say. And also, that guy is in his grand total of two years as a head coach. Let's give him a little time. That's what I would say if we're doing the what-if thing. That's what I would say. Now, I would love to know what happened. Did the Sam Hartman experiment just not pan out? Did Tommy Rees exiting that place as offensive coordinator and Gerard Parker being elevated really not work out? Did they just have a bunch of close losses and really not play as badly as their record indicates? Are we sitting here in December making Notre Dame the poster child for you aren't what your record says you are always? I would love to know the answers to those questions. Lastly, in the what if department, (laughs) this one would drive people mad especially the closer you get to College Station, Texas. Dorian said, what if Texas A&M goes 8-4 and four this season? That is called no man's land. For a fan base that wants a definitive answer this year on whether they got the right guy as their head coach, that is no man's land. That is poison. This is one of those things where you start creeping up to that, I don't know if it's a forbidden statement, but it very much is an undesirable statement. But you're creeping to the point where you get some Aggie fans that say, I'd rather us be six and six than eight and four, because if we're eight and four, that's nowhere good enough for us, but it's also not bad enough to make a move because no one's firing a head coach who goes eight and four, obviously. They'd they'd just rather have one extreme or the other. That is not the entirety of A&M's fan base. I'm telling you there is a portion sizable enough for me to mention on the show that feels that way. And so if they win eight and four, and the losses are to who you would expect them to have losses to, well, I think there would be a December full of question asking, and I would think there would be a statement that would needed to be made, or that would need to be made by the athletic department out there, and uh, we'd see what recruiting did. But if they, if they lose to Bama, if they lose at Tennessee, if they lose at LSU, they drop one more game somewhere there, that's eight and four. The over-under is eight and a half. So, I mean, that's right in the neighborhood of where they're expected to be, but that's the odds maker's point of view. A, a Texas A&M Aggie fan says, well, uh, so we didn't even come close to making a move on Jimbo last year, nor should we. We gave him time. He hired what we think is going to be his play caller. Who knows? I can't get a definitive answer out of him. And uh, we also have given him everything he needs. As a fan base, we've given him everything he needs. If he goes 8-4, and four, he's not giving us everything we need. But I would also remind you of this. His records, since he's been there, have been 9-4, and 8-5. and five. They went 9-1 and one in the COVID year, 8-4, and 5-7. and 8-4 and four is kind of Texas A&M under Jimbo Fisher. So it wouldn't be strange at all. It's just that there's, there's this magical expectation slash wish casting going on out there right now that all of a sudden... Now, 10 and 2 is where we really should be, and then hopefully we get some lucky breaks and 11 and 1, and we don't need 12 and 0. Just let's get to Atlanta. Let's be the one that does what LSU did last year. Why not us, right? Well, um, I'll tell you why not. 
If you win eight and four, that's the why not. And then all of a sudden we have an entirely different conversation on our hands. 